In this video lesson, we'll discuss education reform during the early 1800s and the temperance movement. Tax-supported primary schools were scarce in the early years of the Republic. They existed chiefly to educate the children of the poor, and they were called ragged schools. Advocates of free public education met stiff opposition. Well-to-do conservative Americans gradually saw the light if they did not pay to educate other folks' brats, as they called them. Their children might grow up into a dangerous, ignorant rabble, all armed with the ability to vote. Taxation for education was an insurance premium that the wealthy paid for stability and democracy. Tax-supported public education triumphed between 1825 and 1850. Although it lagged in the slavery-cursed South, laborers wielded increased influence and demanded instruction for children. A free vote cried aloud for free education. The famed Little Red Schoolhouse, with one room, one stove, one teacher, and often eight grades, became the shrine of American democracy. Still, early free schools stayed open only a few months of the year, and school teachers, most of them men in this area, were too often ill-trained, ill-tempered, and ill-paid. These Knights of the Blackboard often boarded around in the community, and some knew scarcely more than their older pupils. They usually taught only the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Rugged Americans thought that this was going to be enough. Reform was urgently needed, and into the breach stepped a man named Horace Mann, a brilliant and idealistic graduate of Brown University, and as secretary of the Massachusetts Board of Education, he campaigned effectively for more and better schoolhouses, longer school terms, and high pay for the teachers who worked in the schools, and an expanded curriculum. His influence radiated out to, radiated out to other states and impressive improvements were chalked up, but education still remained an expensive luxury for many communities. Black slaves in the South were legally forbidden to receive instruction in reading or writing, and free blacks in the North, as well, were usually excluded from schools. Educational advances were aided by improved textbooks, notably those of Noah Webster, a Yale-educated Connecticut Yankee who was known as the Schoolmaster of the Republic. His reading lessons were used by millions of children in the 19th century and were partly designed to promote patriotism. Webster devoted 20 years to his famous dictionary, published in 1828, which helped to standardize the American language. Equally influential was Ohioan William H. McGuffey, a teacher and preacher of rare power, in grade school, his readers sold 122 million copies, and McGuffey's readers hammered home lasting lessons about morality, patriotism, and idealism. You can see here a page from the McGuffey Reader. Higher education was likewise stirring. The religious zeal of the Second Great Awakening led to the planting of many small, denominational, liberal arts colleges in the South and in the West. Too often they were academically anemic, established more to satisfy local pride than to advance the cause of learning. Like the more venerable ivy-draped ivy brethren, the new colleges offered a narrow, tradition-bound curriculum of Latin, Greek, mathematics, and moral philosophy. The first state-supported universities sprang up in the South, beginning with North Carolina in 1795. Federal land grants nourished the growth of state institutions of higher learning. Conspicuous among the early group was the University of Virginia in 1819. The University of Virginia was largely the brainchild of Thomas Jefferson, who designed its beautiful architecture and dedicated university to freedom from religious or political shackles, and modern languages and the science received a great deal of emphasis. Women's higher education was frowned upon in the early decades of the 19th century. A woman's place was believed to be in the home, and training in needlecraft seemed more important than training in algebra for women. Co-education was regarded as frivolous. Prejudices also prevailed that too much learning injured the female brain, undermined the female's health, 
and rendered women unfit for marriage. Women's schools at the secondary level began to attain some respectability in the 1820s, thanks in part to the educated work of Emma Willard. In 1821, she established the Troy Female Seminary and Oberlin College in Ohio. They both jolted traditionalism in 1837 when it opens its doors to women as well as men. Adults who craved more learning satisfied their thirst for knowledge at private subscription libraries or increasingly at tax-supported libraries. Traveling lecturers helped to carry learning to the masses through the Lyceum Lecture Associations. Magazines flourished in the pre-Civil War years, but most of them withered after a short life. The North American Review, founded in 1815, was a long-lived leader of intellectuals. Godey's Lad Book, in 1830, attained enormous circulation of about 150,000. As the Young Republic grew, reform campaigns of all types flourished in sometimes bewildering abundance. Most reformers were intelligent and inspired idealists. The optimistic promises of the Second Great Awakening inspired people to battle earthly evils and moder modern idealists dreamed anew the old Puritan vision of a perfected society, free from cruelty, free from war, free from intoxicating drink, from discrimination, and from slavery. Women were particularly prominent in these reform crusades, especially in their own struggles for suffrage. For many middle-class women, the reform campaigns provided a unique opportunity to escape the confines of the home and to enter into public affairs. In part, the practical, activist Christianity of reformers resulted from desire to reaffirm traditional values as they plunged into a world transformed by the market economy. Mainly middle-class descendants of pioneer farmers, they were unaware that they were witnessing the dawn of the industrial era and either ignored the factory workers or blamed their problems on bad habits. Imprisonment for debt continued to be uh, continued as the poor working classes were especially hard hit by this merciless practice. State legislatures gradually abolished debtors' prisons. Criminal codes in the states were softened. In accordance with more enlightened European practices, the number of capital offenses was being reduced and brutal punishments were slowly being eliminated. And there was a new view that prisons should reform as well as punish. Sufferers from in so-called insanity were still being treated with incredible cruelty, though. Medievalists had believed that the insane were cursed with unclean spirits, and the 19th century idea was that there were, they were willfully perverse and depraved, and many of them were chained and tortured for being insane. In this dismal picture, stepped a New England teacher and author named Dorothea Dix, who traveled and assembled reports on insanity and asylums in her petition of 1843 to the Massachusetts legislature. She turned legislative stomachs and hearts. Agitation for peace also gained momentum in the pre-Civil War years. In 1828, the American Peace Society was formed with a ringing declaration of war on war a leading spirit was William Ladd, who advocated for collective security. The American Peace Crusade, linked with a European counterpart, was making promising progress by the mid-century, but it was set back by the bloodshed of the Crimean War in Europe and the Civil War that occurred in America. The ever-present drink problem attracted de dedicated reformers. Customs led to excessive drinking of hard liquor, even among women, clergymen, and members of Congress. Heavy drinking decreased the efficiency of labor and poorly safeguarded machinery operated under the influence of alcohol increased the danger of accidents at work. Drunkenness also fouled the sanctity of the family, threatening the spiritual welfare and physical safety of women and children. Drinking, in fact, hurt the entire family. The American Temperance Society was formed in Boston in 1826. Within a few years, a, local, a few local groups sprang into existence and implored drinkers to sign the Temperance Pledge and organize children's clubs known as the Cold Water Army. Temperance Crusaders also made effective use of pictures, pamphlets, 
and lurid lecturers to try to discourage drinking excessively. The most popular anti-alcohol tract was T.S. Arthur's melodramatic novel, Ten Nights in a Bar Room and What I Saw There. It was describing a village that was destroyed by the tavern in its town. The book was second only to Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin as a bestseller in the 1850s. Early foes of demon drink adopted two major lines of attack. One was to stiffen the individual's will to resist the wiles of the little brown jug. The moderate reformers then stressed temperance rather than teetotalism. Teetotalism was the total elimination of intoxicants. Uh, into intoxicants, I'm sorry. Zealous believed that the temptation should be removed by legislation. Prominent among this group was Neil Dow of Maine, a blue-nosed reformer who was mayor of Portland and employer of labor, had often witnessed the effects of alcohol. He was called the father of prohibition and sponsored the so-called Maine's Law of 1851, which he hailed as the law of heaven Americanized, prohibiting the manufacture and sale of intoxicating liquor. Other states in the North followed Maine's example, and by 1857, about a dozen had passed various prohibitory laws against alcohol. But still within a decade, some of the statutes were repealed or declared unconstitutional. It was clearly impossible to legislate thirst for alcohol out of existence, yet on the eve of the Civil War, the prohibitionists had registered inspiring gains. There was less drinking among women and probably much less per capita consumption of hard liquor.